when all of these you know uh, things started you know the church was always you know a place where people you know could gather and uh, and share their faith people need to feel that you know they are not alone they have someone with whom they can share you know their uh, tears and sadness and happiness as well uh, and the church is a place you know to encounter uh, not just with God but with other people as well This is the Ukrainian Catholic Cathedral. Taken over in 1968, it has been acting as a center for faith ever since, with an estimated 10,000 Ukrainians attending weekly, crossing multiple generations, drawing people of various backgrounds together. In the past few weeks, attendance has risen, with new members fleeing the war in Ukraine. People have this need to be in church, to have a special relationship with God, because that's something that they can take strength, you know, uh, and develop their faith. A lot of the people who are here today are from Ukraine, uh, and I would say probably quite a few are new, new arrivals to the UK. It's a church like no other in terms of the Ukrainian rite, uh, just the architecture, but you know, um, just at the end of this liturgy, when they sang that last song, it's a song really dedicated to Ukraine, asking for God to protect Ukraine. You could see, see grown men tearing up. I was looking around me. Fundraising for Ukraine has become a pillar of the church's activities since the situation escalated. And part of this was a passionate fundraiser for humanitarian aid, a concert of Ukrainian and Lithuanian musicians. This event ended up raising upwards of 12,000 pounds. Um, so I was approached by Peter Morehouse, um, who is a very keen amateur musician. He, he wanted to do something um, to, to help the, the cause, um, of course, as, as we all want to do, um, to stop us feeling a bit less helpless. Well, to be honest, when when it all started, I knew already that this uh, that the fundraisers is going to be something that I will be doing because this is really the only way I can contribute to the cause. You know, I'm not like a military person or or, or a politician or any like. So I'm a musician, so you know that's what I do. So I do music for Ukraine at this point. But the recent escalation isn't a new war, and aid would have been welcomed for much longer than these 90 days. Many Ukrainians pinned this suffering on 2014 and the invasion of Crimea, looking to the larger war as just the next stage. Since 2014, with the eastern part of Ukraine, there's been war going on there. Just like now there is in the rest of Ukraine, that part of Ukraine has always been going through this for the past several, several years. And it's actually shocking how many people in the UK and other countries just simply weren't aware of that. This morning, more unidentified pro-Russia armed militias controlling the streets of Crimea's capital. The Russian military must stand down, the aspirations of the Ukrainian people must be respected, and political dialogue must be allowed to continue. You know, they maybe were aware of it, you know, the week it happened in 2014 or something, but then people slowly, not slowly, fast, forgot about it actually. There's part of you that that doesn't want to believe that somebody in the 21st century is capable of doing such horrific things. You know, we look back in 2014 when when um, uh, Putin and, um, and his army waltzed into Crimea. And then of course, you know, we've, we've had a lot of distractions since then. It's, it's easy for a lot of people who don't have that emotional connection with Ukraine for things to be brushed under the carpet. Um, particularly with the media as well, it all went very quiet. Um, until now, of course. Everyone was silent. And now we can see the difference between those period and nowadays. We, in mass media, we need to share the information because uh, there's another part of the war, the informational war. What's made clear is that Western media must not forget about the war. 
The suffering of the people in Ukraine is extreme, and support such as that the church provides is essential, both in terms of religious support and more tangible aid. Of course, when all Ukrainians, you know, started coming uh, with the, uh, and uh, these uh, new programs, uh, which was developed for you know for Ukrainian people, uh, you know, we see that there are a lot of people who who we haven't seen before. You know, I saw even during the most uh, <clears throat> dangerous times, uh, the churches are packed in places like Lviv. Um, people, you know, you can be in a, during a divine liturgy and the air raid sirens go off and people stay in the church. So much is the, the feeling of protection there. I, I'm living near a church where the military funerals happen and they're happening on a daily basis. Three soldiers <clears throat> buried at a time. And, you know, you stand there and you watch the families who are left behind. And as much as they're uh, broken by the loss of their loved ones, they do understand, I get the feeling, that this is a fight for Ukraine's existence. Um, their sons and daughters are heroes. I think even people who don't be belong to a certain religion or any religion at all, they still have faith and everybody has hope, you know, which is a big part of religion and not only religion. <laughs> this isn't the first crisis, it won't be the last. I, I think we're also at a phase of this conflict where the interest is leveling off a little bit. And um, it's really, really important for especially mainstream media, the, the big guys in the news business to stay in Ukraine, keep on bringing, you know, their correspondents in to report the story. Because it's not only the war that's going to be the story now, it'll be the reconstruction and development. Oh, oh, oh.